Today we're going to talk about the Americas, but we're going to talk about it through kind of the lens of comparing parts of the Americas to other parts of the Americas. So a big thing we're going to talk about is comparison, which is one of your historical reasoning skills, uh, the historical processing skills um, that is required by the college board. And then we're going to talk about how to think about it, how to approach it. And then we're going to talk about the Americas. And then we're going to take that skill of comparison and we're going to apply it to the Americas. And we'll do some some writing practice uh, as it relates to the Americas. So but that's just a little outline of what we're going to do today. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, I would encourage you, if you are at home and you want to take notes, there'll be quite a bit in here to write down if, if you feel like that would help. So if you need a, a piece of paper now, would be a good time to go ahead and grab it. But before we dive into comparison, I really want to show you this really awesome picture of this uh, beautiful piece of art. This is the double-headed serpent. And you can actually, if you ever travel to London, you could see this in their uh, Royal Museum. Uh, this was a gift given by the leader of the Mexica, sometimes known as the Aztecs, to Fernando Cortez when he landed in uh, the Gulf of Mexico in the 1500s. Now that's, that's in the future. But this is just, a, I think, A, one, this is just a really cool piece of art. But B, we're going to use this art a little bit later to talk about the connections and the developments uh, that occurred in the Americas during this time. So I want you to take a look at this, take it in, enjoy it, and uh, we're going to come on back to this in just a bit. So hold on to it. But if you're like me and you really just admire the beautiful symmetry, right, the loops, the two-headed serpents, um, it's just very cool. But we're going to come back to this in a little bit, so just keep it in your mind for now. So first things first, let's really quick make sure we go over uh, the thinking skill known as comparison. So this is one of your historical reasoning processes, and this is essentially taking two things and putting them side by side. And so you're going to see comparison in three parts of the AP. Exam. You may or may not see it in all three parts, but you'll definitely see it in one, if not more, than three parts. And so you'll definitely see it in the multiple choice. There'll probably be at least one multiple choice question uh, that asks you to compare two things. They might give you some stimulus and then they'll say, describe the similarities, or and they might say, identify the similarities. And then you might see another question that asks you to explain why these two things are different. This is not an uncommon thing to see with a stimulus-based question. So be like, here are two things, identify how they're different, and explain why they're different. Uh, this is a very common thing to see in the multiple choice questions. You might also see this in the short answer questions uh, that you get when you do your SAQs. Uh, it might be asking you to compare uh, a place to another place. You might be saying, oh, compare um, Europe at this time with uh, Asia at this time. So it might be asking you to do a comparison um, in the sense that it will give you a stimulus about either something from Europe or something from Asia and say something like, oh, why don't you compare these two things? And last but not least, you might get that in the, in, you might choose to take your long essay question in the form of a comparison answer. Now, if you're familiar with the long essay question, you get to choose your historical reasoning process um, and you might choose to do a comparison, in which case you'd have to do the same thing as before, where you describe the similarities, you explain why those similarities are similar or those differences are different. Um, but when you do the LEQ, you're actually taking this third step, which is you're explaining the relative historical significance by choosing uh, pieces of evidence to put in your essay. And we're going to talk about that a little bit today. Uh, we'll, we'll get some evidence that you could specifically use in either, say, an SAQ or in a, uh, an LAQ. So we're gonna, I'm going to give you some specific stuff you could address and use, both on a, a broad level but also on a very narrow level. So describe, as always, is just kind of the what. A good way to think about these first two is that describe is the what, explain is the why. And of course, this relative historical significance, which is what you do automatically when you write an LEQ, is you're just explaining what's the most important part about this particular similarity or this particular difference. And when you provide your evidence, that's actually what you're doing. So how should you go about thinking about it? 
the comparison? Well, it's comparison is a relatively straightforward uh, task, and you do it all the time, I think, whether you realize it or not. Um, you're always putting two things side by side, right? Like apples and oranges. It's, it's something we do a lot of times without even thinking about it, right? You put two things side by side. And that's a good way to visualize it. If you have to analyze two different things, just put them side by side. And then, voila, you can automatically begin to see some differences. Um, and so that's what a good way to think about it is simply a side by side visual. Um, so for example, this picture of an apple and this picture of an orange. If you look at that photo, you can probably right away identify some differences. What, what are some differences? Anyone spot any differences between this apple on the left and this orange on the right. Well, one is uh, one is orange, as its name implies, uh, and the other one is green, an apple, just as. So on the surface, we have the colors being different. Um, if you're a fruit lover, then you know that you can't really eat an orange peel, or you could, but it wouldn't taste very good. Um, but if you're, you, you can eat the skin of an apple, some people prefer not to, but you could eat the skin of an apple if you needed to. Um, and so there's a difference, right? But on a similarity note, they both have sugars in them and they're both classified as fruits. So we've got some similarities and some differences right there when talking about this fruit. And in the same way, uh, even if you put two very similar looking uh, religions or societies together, you may quickly find that in fact, they have quite a few differences. And so that's a good way to think about it, is to put it side by side, where it can become a little more obvious what's similar and what's different. So juxtaposition is always a good way to do this. Um, for those of you who are slightly more logically inclined or mathematically inclined, you can also think about it as a simple formulation. Um, think about it as two things, two events, two elements, is A and B, right? If A is equal to B, then there's a similarity. If A is not equal to B, then there's a difference, right? And of course, you have to explain why. Why are these differences here? Um, why aren't they similar? Why are they different? But it's just a good way to think about it if you're a little more logically inclined or mathematically inclined. If A equals B, similarity. If A is not equal to B, then different as it applies to developments, events, and other historical evidence. All right. Let's move forward. Then let's talk about the Americas really quick. So in your AP World History Unit 1, uh, the Americas are restricted to uh, forms of government, right? Uh, in Afro-Eurasia, as in America, state forms uh, developed, and sometimes they stay the same, and sometimes they change. This is something we see all the time. So this is what the AP people want you to know. And we'll go over this today, not to worry. But um, in this stream, we're also going to expand on that and we're going to talk about cultural phenomena, we're going to talk about economics, and we're going to talk about technology, uh, specifically agricultural technology and methods of production. And if you're really interested in that, a little bit later this week, I have a stream where I'm going to talk about specifically boosting agricultural production. So that's what we're going to talk about. Let's go ahead and get underway. I want to start with a really quick introduction, just in case, just in case we're not super familiar with the Americas. That term refers to both North and South America, as you can see on this map, North America at the top, uh, and South America below, but it also includes the Caribbean islands, which are right here. Uh, and sometimes people forget about Central America, which kind of is the little land bridge that connects North and South America. So there is that. Uh, in the Americas, in Unit 1, there are four major cultural and political zones. And I say this because sometimes the whole area was under the control of one state, but other times it may have been several states or a cultural, uh, cultural mix of different groups. So the four areas you have uh, are the Andean culture in South America, the Mesoamerican cultural zone in what is now Mexico and Central America, you have the Southwest culture, which is what today is Northern Mexico and the United States. And you have the Mississippi culture, which kind of is centered around the Mississippi River in the Eastern half of the United, what would now be the United States. And so in each of these zones, you have 
sometimes a single political entity ruling, but other times you have um, several political entities, but they all share uh, similar cultural history, sometimes similar cultural traits, sometimes common economic activities. Outside of these zones, humans still lived. I don't want you to think that there weren't people living in the Americas, but outside of these zones, humans lived in much smaller groups where someone's culture might be limited to like your village and the next one over had a, a, a totally different culture. And so, for example, regions such as the Caribbean, um, the Great Plains of the United States and the Pampas of what is now Argentina in the South, uh, as well as in the Amazon rainforest, people still persisted and existed. Uh, they lived in hunter-gatherer societies or uh, were nomadic, but there were definitely groups of people living in these areas. They just didn't form a large enough group to be what we would consider a cultural zone, um, and just for the sake of, of studying the world. So, and again, when you want to talk about things that are similar and different, right? How are these groups living here different from these groups that are living here? something to think about as we kind of go through this. So if you've got a pen and paper and you want to do a little writing down, we're going to just go over some uh, vocabulary. We're going to talk about these later on, um, but I wanted to get the definition down. So when I bring it up again, it's not super confusing. Uh, we're going to talk about how these words specifically could be used in comparing or contrasting societies in the Americas. So the very first word I have for you here is Hebrew. And this is actually a form of record keeping used by the Incas in South America. Um, and it's not a right, I know we think of record keeping and we might think of like the written word, but Hebrews are actually strings with knots in them, knots of different sizes, knots of different lengths apart. And these knots indicated a record of some sort. Um, two knots meant something, two knots close together meant something, two knots far apart meant something. And so it's really interesting that we have this form of record keeping that isn't in the traditional sense of the word, a written language or a written record. Um, we also have something called the water water, which is a kind of irrigation canal. And this was used by the Inca where they had raised agricultural beds and then they utilized the irrigation in between them. And then we have something called the Carpenon, which is a road that, I should say it's not a single road, much like the Silk Road, it is a super large network of roads that all connected the Inca Empire uh, into one. And last but not least, we have another agricultural term called the Chinampa, and it's a type of raised agricultural bed used in swamps uh, by the Mexica people, again, sometimes known as the Aztec people. And so these words we're going to use as we go through this kind of presentation. And these could be potentially evidence if you're trying to make an argument for comparison uh, or, or difference, something that's the same or something that's different. These, these terms could be your evidence if you're trying to make a case. So real quick, I'm going to run over the four major, uh, the three major uh, cultural zones that we're going to mostly talk about today, just so you have an idea of what we're, what we're going over. Uh, we're going to quick run over them, just some fast facts for your information. So that you have, um, you got some info. So really quick, we're going to first talk about a group called the Cahokia, also sometimes known as the Mississippi culture. Um, and these were a series of towns and settlements, the largest of which was called Cahokia, which is sometimes why it's called, the whole thing is called Cahokia. Uh, and they were all along the Mississippi River, what's now the Eastern United States. Um, in Missouri, uh, Illinois, Arkansas. And this wasn't really a centralized state like you would think of, but actually it was more a, a confederation of tribes. In Cahokia, which is a, an artist depiction uh, right here, um, is the largest of these cities. And it was primarily a religious center. It wasn't so much a town where people lived in 24 seven, but it was a religious center and it did have a population of 10,000. Um, and if you'd like to know more about the Cahokia, I did include an article in the resources for this um, particular uh, stream that gives you kind of a nice overview of uh, the Cahokia and who they were and a little bit about their culture. We don't know a lot, and when I say we, we archaeologists, don't actually know that much. A lot of it has been lost to time. 
because the Cahokia had disappeared before even the Europeans arrived. And so when the Europeans arrived, the natives who were living there said, yeah, we don't know who came before us. So there's a lot of speculation, but that's sometimes what happens in the history. There's just a limit to what we know. Sometimes they're known as the mound builders because they they created a number of very large mounds. You can still see in the Mississippi uh, region sometimes along the Mississippi River. Um, Cahokia Mound State Museum in Illinois is home to what's called the Monk's Mound, which is one of the largest ones they ever built. While not as large as the Pyramid of Giza, it does have the, the base dimension to the Pyramid of Giza. And so it's as wide and as long as the Pyramid of Giza was, but it is, not as, it is no longer as tall, if it ever was as tall as the Pyramid of Giza. So let's talk about a group called the Mexica really quick. Now you might know the Mexica as a different name. You might call them the Aztecs. Um, this is an older term, and it's sort of falling out of favor with a lot of historians, and maybe even in your own textbook. Um, but for the most part, uh, the, the term Mexica is becoming more popular because the Aztec uh, doesn't really convey the complexity of the state. And so far from being an empire, it was, more, it was an alliance of three cities who all spoke a common language. Uh, the cities were Tenochtitlan, Texcoco, and Tlacopan. And these cities were all Nahuatl speaking, and they were in an alliance together. However, Tenochtitlan, which is where the Mexica are from, uh, was the largest of all these cities. Uh, and so it very quickly became the dominant one uh, among this alliance of three cities. And by the way, does anybody notice a similarity between the word Mexica and another word we use today when describing uh, a part of the world. Yes, Mexico. This is where the word Mexico comes from. It comes from Mexica. And if you've seen the Mexican flag, you may have seen this image of an eagle eating a serpent. This is actually a Mexica legend. Um, when the Mexica people moved to Tenochtitlan, um, it was an island in the middle of Lake Texcoco, and they were not sure what to do, but then they saw a serpent eating a serpent being consumed by an eagle on a cactus, and this they took as a sign from their god that this was where they should build their city, and this is where they would build their empire, and they did. And so that's why this symbol of a, of a, of a serpent being consumed by an eagle on a cactus um, is on the flag of Mexico. It's why Mexico has the name Mexica. It's this connection to their heritage that's very important. Then we're going to talk about a group called the Inca, who lived along the Andes mountains. If you see this map right here, this is actually the extent of the Inca Empire. Um, you'll notice that it is completely along the spine of South America. And so the Inca are something that should be somewhat familiar of all the states in the Americas. If you've already looked at, um, if you've already looked at, say, the Mongol Empire or China or the Islamic world, then the Inca should be the most familiar to you of all the states in the Americas. The Inca most closely resembled uh, what we would consider a, an organized empire um, along the lines of the old world in Europe. Um, so they had a capital uh, in a place called Cusco. They had these quipus that I mentioned earlier for record keeping. They had a huge road network that crisscrossed this entire empire. It went up mountains, down mountains, and across valleys and through tunnels. It was a massive road network, much like the Roman road network, if you wanted to compare that, or the, the Chinese roads that they constructed during the Sui Dynasty and the Tang Dynasty. There's lots of parallels you can draw here. They had an interesting system of labor referred to as the Mita, and we're going to talk a little bit more about the Mita, but it was a unique labor system. Um, and so control of labor, a trade network, an infrastructure, a form of record keeping, a bureaucracy, and, it's, and a set capital. These are all things that we would associate with an old world empire. And so in this case, the Incas should be some of the most familiar to us when we think about similarities between, say, the Americas and other parts of the world. And it's also worth noting the Inca were not the first people to ever have an empire along this area. Um, the uh, previous groups known as the Boche and the Norte Chico had also built cities along these uh, the valleys that dot the spine of South America. And so the Inca were largely building upon their predecessors that had lived in this area before them. 
that. We also built uh, cities in the valleys that dot the spine of South America. And as I mentioned before, they had this extensive regional trade network. They also traded with the Amazon, which is over here, and they traded uh, south into the Atacama Desert, which is down just south of this tip right here. So let's take a quick example. I want to give you an example about how you could compare uh, two of these cultures, uh, the Mexica and the Mississippi. So one comparison you can make is that both the Mississippi culture and the Mexica relied on large bodies of water. So for example, utilizing large bodies of water is your event or your development, which you're going to compare. This is your thing. But now you need the evidence if you're going to claim that both these cultures did this. This is a similarity. You're going to need some evidence to show them. Well, you can point out that the Mississippi River, which is a large body of water, uh, was used by the Cahokia as a trading route. And you can also point out that the Lake Texcoco, where the, where the Mexica had their capital, uh, is also where they had a lot of their agriculture in the form of the Chinampas, which I mentioned earlier. Um, and so answering the question of how each side utilizes a body of water is both an evidence and an explanation for why uh, these two cultures could be put side by side, these two, these two states could be put side by side. And so this is kind of an example of a comparison, maybe something you might see on an SAQ asking you, how did American societies interact with their environment, perhaps? Uh, that's just one possibility. So one of the first things you'll notice if you look at the, the Mexica, the Cahokia, the, the Ingos, and the, the Mayans, is that they do share quite a bit in the way of religious similarities. For example, almost every single one of them has a sun deity. So the Mexica have a sun deity known as Hitsulipoti, um, the Inca have a sun god named it Inti, who is the chief god, the number one god. Uh, not so for the Mexica, but yes, so for the Inca. And even though we don't know much about the Cahokia, we do know that their ruler was referred to as the Great Sun. And so even though that's not a divine term, that definitely indicates the sun was uh, very important uh, during the, 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 to the Cahokia people. Um, we also notice that there's some similarity in deities that resemble food, such as Zinteatu, Zinteatu, sorry, Zinteatu, which was a Mexica deity who was literally uh, had corn coming out of uh, the top of their head, and according to some versions of the story, made humans uh, by taking them out of a husk of corn. And we're going to talk about why corn or maize is so important in just a second, but it's interesting. You also have Yom Cox which was the Mayan deity of a very similar nature, also made of corn or had corn coming out of their head and also created humans by taking them out of a husk of corn. And so corn or maize plays a really big role in the religions of both of these places. Uh, you also have something called bloodletting. And you might know this word a little better as like human sacrifice, um, but not every culture require human sacrifice all the time. It's really important to make this distinction. The Aztecs did do a lot of human sacrificing, but they also did what we might call a partial sacrifice, where they simply like cut open their hand and spilled some blood on the ground. Um, so that would be, that would be the call of letting. Now, if you die over the course of doing that, that would be like total bloodletting. So <laughs> that would kill you, that would not be a fun thing. But for the S, for, for the Mexica, and for the Maya in, in particular, uh, bloodletting was really important because in their mythologies, the gods had given up their blood to create the earth, and therefore it's only natural that humans now have to give up their blood to continue the earth. This is why the Aztecs, or so the Mexica, had such a, a history of human sacrifice. It's why they're so well known for it. It's why they did it on such a grand scale, um, because it was an incredibly important part of their religion. And the Mayans also do this on a very grand scale. Now, just in case you thought it was only the Inca, or, or the Mexica and the Maya, there is evidence that both the Cahokia, that is the Mississippi, and the Inca also practiced human sacrifice or bloodletting, but to a much uh, smaller degree than was done in the Mexica states, uh, the Mexica state or in the Mayan city states. 
So it's interesting that there is a degree of bloodletting across all of these cultures. Um, sometimes it's very intense, sometimes it's not particularly intense. Um, but this idea that human blood needs to be spilled for the good of uh, for the good of the gods is a very important and interesting similarity across all of these, if you ask me. And so uh, I showed you this photo right here. This is the Mishika Maze god, uh, Zintaoku. And then up here is kind of a, a, a European depiction of an Inca person worshiping at the Sun Temple of Inti, of, of Inti, sorry, of Inti. So these are just two depictions of the, some of the deities. Um, we also have a lot of architectural similarities across the Americas. Um, and it's mainly in the form of big temples, big triangle shaped temples. For example, the Great Temple of the Mexica, which is in Mexico City, which is no longer standing, although you can still see the foundations if you go to Mexico City. Um, large, massive, uh, pyramid-shaped temple. The same thing at Sacsayhuaman uh, in, in uh, the old Inca capital of Cusco. Uh, it was also a gigantic pyramid-shaped temple. And the Monk's Mound, which you can find in Illinois, the Cahokia Monk's Mound Museum. Um, it's interesting that all, all the major cultures had pyramid-shaped temples. There's a lot of similarities there. It speaks to the possibility of some religious diffusion, perhaps. Although there's no solid evidence that anybody from the Mexica ever came up to um, the Cahokia lands and said, hey, build your temple in this shape like we did. Um, it is an interesting uh, coincidence in comparison. So something to think about is that all these architectural similarities across these states in the Americas. There's also differences in administration. And by this, I mean the structure of the states. So the Mexica and the Inca are by far the most centralized states in the Americas. They're the ones that look the most like what we recognize, like empires or like uh, kingdoms in Europe or empires in Asia. So these are the big centralized states. Uh, the Mexica a little less so than the Inca, but nonetheless still a high degree of centralization. The Maya city-states and the Pueblo, located in the southwest, uh, are both what we would call independent city-states, somewhat like the Greeks, uh, where each city-state had its own ruler, had its own deity, um, <clears throat> and did its own thing. And then you have the Cahokia, which is an interesting example of a confederation where you had a number of cities come together um, and acknowledge a ruler, and acknowledge a religious authority uh, located in Cahokia. And so this is not really a centralized state, but it's also not a series of independent uh, cities or, or tribes or villages, um, but it's somewhere in between. And so these are the different ways that these states have centralized their authority. A big point of comparison between two of them would be between the question of domination or incorporation, specifically as it applies to the Mexica and the Inca. So the Mexica, when they would conquer an area, they actually wouldn't do very much. They'd leave the people alone, provided that the people paid tribute. Now, this tribute was sometimes in the form of material goods, uh, feathers, gold, uh, resources. Uh, but sometimes this material was, in fact, in the form of humans. And the purpose of these humans uh, were to be sacrificed in the Mexica bloodletting rituals, as you can see here uh, on the right. Now, as you can imagine, uh, that did not make people very happy with the Mexica. Uh, they were, were not very well liked because of this particular practice. Um, this made a lot of people very resentful, and it's going to come back to haunt them later on. Um, but you also then have the example of the Inca, who sought to actually incorporate their subjects into their state. Um, and one of the ways they did this was with their labor system that I mentioned earlier called the Mita system. And I want to take a second and explain that the Mita system is a form of labor. It's a form of taxation, actually, uh, in the form of labor. And so essentially every male between the ages of 15 and 50 would be required to do a set number of days of labor for the state, whatever the state needed you to work on. You would, you'd leave your village, you'd take some food, and you would go work for the state for a couple of, I believe, anywhere from five to 15 days, um, doing whatever they needed you to do. 
Um, and this allowed them, of course, to build such a, a highly complicated society, um, such as, for example, the Carpenon, which is that road system I mentioned earlier, was largely built on the labor of the, the Mita system. And so when we think about state building practices, there is kind of this question of, of do you dominate your subjects, demand tribute, keep them under your thumb, uh, use fear, uh, human sacrifice and fear to keep them in line, or do you try to bring them in to your, to your empire and do you try to use them and um, have them better your state or society? It's an interesting question when we compare the, the Mexica and the Inca side by side as these two different approaches to state building and statecraft. Then we have some agricultural technology. So every major society in the Americas had some form of major agricultural technology. Um, as I mentioned, the Inca had the waru waru, which is a kind of a raised bed, and it allowed water to run in between it. Um, but the Inca, because they lived in the, the Andes mountain, also practiced a lot of terracing. And if you're familiar with terracing, that's where you farm the side of a mountain by creating room to grow food there. Uh, and this was very important for the Inca because much of their territory is located on mountains. Uh, China also practiced a great deal of terracing. Southern China in particular um, practiced a good deal of terracing at this time as well. So it's not just the Inca, but the Inca were well known in the Americas for practicing terracing. In the Mexica area, we have the Chinampas. Now, if you recall, the Inca capital was, or the, the, the Mexica capital was located on Lake Texcoco. Um, and in Lake Texcoco, they built up these islands. They dredged uh, dirt from the bottom of the lake and created these artificial islands. Um, in dredging all of that dirt, uh, they brought up a rich sediment that was really great for farming. And so you had these islands on the lake that you could row to. And this is a picture of, of the Chinampa in, in the early 1900s. There were still many Chinampas in, in the area around Mexico City. Um, there are not as many today. Mexico City is a massive, huge you know, metropolis, so there's not a lot of room for uh, these anymore. But you can still see them in some places, really far outside of Mexico City. Um, the Maya, interestingly enough, living in where they did on the Yucatan Peninsula in, in Mesoamerica, did not have access to very many bodies of fresh water. And so I've included a video that goes into much more detail about this. Um, but the Maya had a very intricate system for of controlling and capturing water. And this was critical because they didn't have any easily available fresh sources of water, like a lake or a river. Um, and the rivers and lakes they had were very small. So it was critical that they have easy access to a supply of fresh water. And so one of the things that all of these places had in common in the Americas was that they all had, they adapted to their environments, they adapted their activities cultural technologies to their environments, and this is very important. And so you can draw comparisons between uh, these similarities connecting uh, their, their agricultural production to their environment, but maybe discuss how it's different uh, in terms of what they have to do based on their location. And let's talk about some similarity with their agricultural products now. You might recognize this as corn, but corn was domesticated from this little piece of grass. Um, and maize was very important to the Americans. Maize was relatively easy to grow, and it was also relatively easy to spread and diffuse. And for being something so easy to grow, it was immensely calorie dense. Um, you could grow a lot of it, and you could eat it, and you would be all right, provided you had a slightly varied diet and you can just eat corn if you supplement it with other things. Corn could be the basis for your diet. And corn ended up being the basis of the American diet. And by that I mean North and South America. Every single society in the Americas um, consumed maize and corn to one degree or the other. Um, you see it in the Cahokia and the Mississippi. Uh, you see it in the Inca, in the Andes, in the Mexica in central Mexico. It's literally, there isn't a society in the Americas uh, that didn't consume um, corn in some way, shape, or form. 
another example of a product that, that was used across the Americas would be the cocoa leaves. Um, and if anyone's ever visited, if you ever visit Peru and you want to see the Inca uh, settlements and cities, they'll offer you cocoa leaves for your trip because cocoa leaves are known to cure altitude sickness, which is part, part of the reason why the Inca use them. But they are mainly a stimulant. If you chew on these leaves, um, it gives kind of a stimulating feeling. Um, this is where, this is one of the places uh, that uh, we get a chocolate from with these cocoa leaves. And an interesting point of note, uh, this is not a similarity, this is actually a difference, but potatoes, which were domesticated in the Andes, uh, in the Incas, despite the fact that potatoes, much like corn, are very easy to grow, um, you just throw them in the dirt and wait, um, they never actually spread outside of the Andes. We, there's no potato consumption in central Mexico or in, in the Mississippi. So it's interesting, we have some diffusion in the form of corn, uh, but we don't see the same thing for potatoes, despite the fact that potatoes, much like corn, are very easy to grow and can be the cornerstone of a diet. Um, so this is kind of an interesting uh, point of di differentiation. We talk about agricultural similarities. Um, really quick, I want to practice a little bit with the thesis. We've been talking a lot about evidence, um, but I want to talk a little bit about putting some of that into action. So if you had to write a thesis for an essay, and your prompt said something like this, write a thesis that evaluates the extent to which the Mexica differed from the Inca. So if you were being asked to write a difference essay or something that looked at the difference, um, what evidence that we just spent a little bit of time talking about could you use um, to make a case, to, to make an argument about the difference? A couple things you could talk about when discussing uh, similarities between, say, the Inca or the Mexica. Uh, you could talk about their administrative practices, right? The Mexica demanding tribute versus the Inca trying to incorporate people into their state. Uh, you could talk about how um, the Inca had this vast trade network that tried to sponsor trade, um, and they supported it via the construction of roads, such as the Carpanan that I showed you earlier, um, versus you talk about how most other American societies didn't have such an emphasis on trade uh, in the Aztec Empire, for, in, the, in the Mexica, for example, they didn't have a merchant class that was supported by the authorities. Uh, you could talk about how the Mayans maybe had a written language uh, versus the other states of the Americas that didn't have fully developed written languages. And you could potentially draw some comparisons and similarities between those agricultural technologies and their, imp and their implementation. So these are some of the things you could have uh, drawn parallels with. I'm sure you could think of others. Um, but let's really quick get a practice thesis up here. So I took a few of those and I created a quick practice thesis that if I was given a question about the similarity between the Mexica and the Inca, I would have said something like this. The Mexica differed from the Inca politically because the Inca used the Mita labor system, while the Mexica merely demanded tribute from their conquered vassals. Also, the Inca promoted trade via the state for example, the Carpanon, while the Mexica did not encourage trade. And so if I was being asked to draw a comparison, a similarity or a difference, these are just a few of the things that I would talk about. I'm sure you could find some other stuff to pick up on. Now I wanna, I kinda wanna start wrapping this up a little bit with um, a discussion about something called the American Silk Road. Now this is a term that um, isn't explicitly said by the historian Robert Strayer, but kind of inspired me because if you use uh, Ways of the World by Robert Strayer as your textbook, he talks about how while the, the Silk Road gets a lot of praise and attention and, and you know, looks cool because it's well-documented, extensive, we you know, whole chapters about it, um, the, in the Americas they had something somewhat similar to this. They had a loosely interactive web stretching from the Great Lakes to the north by the Mississippi down to the Inca uh, in the Andes. And so in a way, the Americas kind of have their own form of silk, of, like the Silk Road, where you had ideas, 
you had trade goods, you had foods uh, being diffused along this road, much in the same way uh, the Silk Road did. And I'm sure that if you just sat for a second, you could think about some similarities. Um, but I want to give you a few while we're at it, some of the things that were exchanged. So, for example, a cultural uh, good that was exchanged was something called uh, the ball game, sometimes known as Poktapok. Uh, and you might have seen it uh, in, in cartoons or in movies, but it's this game where you have uh, a ball, a rubber ball, and you try to get it through uh, a hoop, a kind of a stone uh, hoop that's not uh, flat, but it's actually sideways, as you can see in the photo here. Uh, very similar to the game of basketball, except unlike in the game of basketball, uh, if you lose this game in, in Mexica society, you might actually be sacrificed as the losing team. That did happen sometimes, not all the time. But the Mayans were also known to um, to sometimes ritually bind a captive in the shape of a ball uh, to sacrifice them because it was believed that the gods had played a sacred ball game when they created the earth. And so for the Mayans, uh, this ball game was really important and it played a really big role in their society. Now, while the Inca did not uh, adopt the ball game, the Inca did uh, adopt rubber, which is what they used to create the ball that was played in the ball game. And so while the Inca did not adopt the ball game itself, they did adopt rubber and so we see that rubber as a good diffused along this American Silk Road uh, because of this game uh, diffused along the American Silk Road. Another thing that diffused along the American Silk Road would be um, some mathematical ideas and some writing ideas. So the Mayans are the only ones that we know of that had a fully developed writing system. And by that, I mean it was not just a series of hieroglyphs, but it had words and pronunci it had um, pronunciations. You could read it backwards and forwards. Um, it was a fully developed system. Uh, the Mexica never quite has a system that extensive, but it's believed by anthropologists they borrowed some of their their writing system uh, for. Uh, they borrowed some of the Maya writing system for uh, their writing system. Uh, David, I mean, this, thank you. I appreciate that, David. Thank you very much. Um, something else that the Aztecs also, sorry, the Mexica, I keep saying Aztecs, see how embedded that term is? Um, the Mexica also borrowed the math system, the Mayans that they're using, which is a base 20 system. Now, if you know the United States and most of the world, we use a base 10 system. So this is a little bit different from what we would been used to seeing. But that the, that the Mexica had borrowed all of this from the Aztecs, um, or sorry, the Mexica borrowed this from the Mayans. See, I'm confusing myself now. Um, is proof of intellectual and cultural exchange. There's also maize, which as I mentioned, almost every American society consumes to some degree. But there's also the curious case of turquoise, which is this beautiful blue stone I have a photo of over here. Um, this comes from the region of the American Southwest. That's where you find most of it. Um, it's found, it was mined by the Pueblo people. But even though most of it is found in that part of the world, and even today it's very important to the Native Americans that live there, um, that still live there on the reservations and, and in the area, uh, it, this was found in all societies, like all over the Americas, all the way down to the Andes, all as far north as the, the Cahokia and the Mississippi. Um, so turquoise is an interesting, much like silk. So maybe we should call this the turquoise road and not the silk road. So we should call it the turquoise road. I think that's actually a pretty good uh, title for it, considering that turquoise was the thing that characterized this road. It's the thing that every American society used to some extent. So maybe we should call it the turquoise road. I like that. Um, and I want to bring it back to this image I showed you at the very beginning, because this lovely piece of art also embodies some of that uh, exchange. So for example, the turquoise that dots this beautiful, you know, these little turquoise pieces that dot this beautiful piece of art, um, those are probably from the Pueblo region of the, uh, what's now the United States and Northern Mexico, but it was probably uh, imported by uh, merchants from the Mexica. These oyster shells that make up part of the teeth um, are from the Gulf of Mexico. And so in order to 
build this beautiful piece of art, you had to have elements from across the Americas. So this art is, is a small example of um, the kind of cultural and material exchange that took place across the Americas. You have a, a, a Mexica, a religious symbol made of elements from the Pueblo region as well as the Mexica region. It's now on display in London. And again, if you ask me, just a very cool, very awesome piece of art. But there were some limits, and I want to bring these up because I don't want to necessarily get the impression that, that this turquoise road was exactly the same as the Silk Road in Eurasia. So there are some differences. Robert Strayer points out that there was actually more exchange within a region than there was actually exchange across a region. So for example, that Mayan writing system was utilized to an extent by the Aztecs, but it never was utilized by the Inca, never utilized by the Cahokia. Uh, it pretty much stayed a local Mesoamerican phenomenon. And much like the uh, Silk Road, but still different to a degree, and I'll explain this, you didn't have a single religious tradition that managed to dominate multiple regions. So for example, on the Silk Road, for a little while, you had Buddhism uh, be the dominant religion across the Silk Road. And then, then eventually you get Christianity and Islam. And these places, they all develop kind of their sphere of influence, but it's multiple regions. So you have Christianity in Europe, uh, but then you also have Islam in the Middle East and in parts of Central Asia. You have Buddhism in parts of Central Asia and parts of China. Um, but in the Americas, no single religious tradition was ever able to gain enough followers to dominate an entire region. Within, for example, the Mayan societies, um, although the, the, the Mexica borrowed some of their religious traditions, um, the Mexica still maintained a degree of cultural independence. Same thing with the Pueblo. Same thing with the Cahokia and the, and the Incas in the Andes. Um, there was not a religious tradition that promised to encompass all of the Americas. There was no, so to speak, universal religion of the Americas like there was in the Silk Road. Um, another thing that kind of limits this is that there was a great degree of geographic barriers kind of putting themselves between uh, regions. So for example, the Andes, between the Andes and the, and the Mayan city-states, there's a great deal of very heavy jungle. And between, for example, the Mexica and central Mexico and the Pueblo, there are miles of inhospitable desert. Um, and so these geographic barriers proved to be, in some cases, very hard to surmount. Now, of course, the Silk Road wasn't exactly a picnic. If, you were, if you've done some work in your class, you might realize that uh, you know, the Silk Road had the Taklamapro Desert. Uh, it was some very dangerous to cross parts of the Silk Road, but it would, there were other ways. If you couldn't go through a desert, maybe you could go around it. This was much harder to do in the Americas, um, just because the, the barriers were, were very difficult to surmount. Another thing is that there was a limit of technology. The wheel had not been discovered in the Americas by this time. It had not been invented, if you will. And so the only way to get anywhere that wasn't walking or walking is you could potentially take uh, the one domesticated animal in the Americas, uh, which was the llama in the, uh, in the Andes Mountains. Um, but this was not like the horse. Llamas are, are a little less cooperative than horses or camels or water buffalo. They did allow the Inca to trade effectively within their own region but it was hard to go across regions. And llamas never were domesticated outside of uh, the Andes. You don't, llamas never spread to like the Maya, and llamas never spread to the Aztecs. They are a very geographically limited animal. So um, again, there were just a lot of limits on the turquoise road. And I bring these up because when you're writing an essay, when you're writing your LEQ, or maybe you're writing your DBQ, you can bring up these limits as a way to describe a level of nuance. This is part of your complexity point. And when we do more streams about the DBQ, uh, they'll go more into, into what makes a complexity point. But one of the things that can really get like a killer complexity point is if you point out nuance. And some nuance might be saying that, hey, yeah, the Americas had this trade network very similar to the Silk Road, but it wasn't exactly like the Silk Road. It was a little different. 
right? And these are some of the ways it was different. So something to think about. Um, so I have this SAQ question. It's a, it's a practice SAQ. And it's asking how uh, the Mita system in the Aztec, or in the Inca Empire was similar to like European serfdom uh, before the 1400s. And so comparing this labor system to this other labor system, you know, there's some things to think about, like both of these labor systems were run by the government, although different types of governments, right? Feudal lords versus a centralized empire. Um, they utilized labor for state projects. Feudal lords would demand that peasants build castles for them, and they even could use the labor for the carpenter. And of course, this is not free labor. This is, these are forms of what we would call coerced labor or forced labor. Although maybe not all the time, it was free sometimes. And so this is the answer that I might provide. You go ahead and have a look at that. With that, I'm gonna wrap it on up. If there are any teachers watching uh, right now, I just wanna give you a, a few ways you can talk about comparison in your classrooms. Um, have students compare themselves to their siblings. This is something that, that always gets kids going. I am not like my brother. My brother is silly and, and much cooler than him, right? Well, if you're cooler than your brother, please tell me why. I'd love to hear it, right? Why is your brother so silly and not cool, right? Kids love doing that. Um, ask them about their favorite sports teams, right? Compare them to a sport team, right? Um, my students love talking about the trades that are going on. Like, oh, did you hear they traded this player for this player and then this player for this player? Right? Ask them what that means. Ask them how that trade potentially uh, affects that team. Ask them to compare those teams post-trade. So that's something. And of course, the use of Venn diagrams is very helpful um, when introducing comparison. The Venn diagram is the two circles that overlap with each other. This helps visualize that juxtaposition as I was talking about earlier. So if you're a teacher and you're watching, these are just some ways you could incorporate uh, these are just some ways that you could incorporate uh, comparison practice into your class and your routine. And as always, of course, I've got, I'm, I'm done for now. This is about all I've got, but as always, of course, think Fiveable uh, on Twitter, on Instagram, on YouTube, and then follow us. Uh, catch some of those awesome streams I talked about earlier. Um, and have a great day. Thanks for coming. Thanks for watching. I appreciate everybody who participated. And uh, hopefully I'll see you next time.